Well, thanks everyone for showing up today. Uh, my name is Neil Primzic and uh, I'll introduce Rakuten very briefly and then we'll get on to the actual talk by Fuxan in a second. Okay. So about me, I'm me, uh, Vice General Manager of uh, Personalization and Merchandising Department. I uh, used to be Big Data Department, change names, but maybe Big Data sounds better. Uh, as far as Rectin goes, uh, you may not have heard of us, but we're, we're not a small company. We're in 30 countries. Uh, we have 1.6 billion members. It's not a typo. Uh, a good chunk of those are coming from Viber. Uh, we have 70, it says services, but it's actually uh, companies under the Rectin Group umbrella. And each year we touch about 27 trillion yen in uh, sales. So that's about 240 billion US dollars every year. Within the department I'm representing today, uh, we do uh, mostly in Japan, but around the world, we do recommendation and personalization. And this is what the talk will focus on today. Uh, we do demand forecasting and inventory optimization, basically logistics. When you're dealing with this much inventory moving, uh, you, you need to be optimized. Uh, of course, advertising, I'm very sorry, but I do a lot of advertising. Uh, search ranking and optimization, catalog science and image science. Uh, all of these topics are just rich in terms of machine learning. And we could do many, many, many presentations uh, if there's interest in these. Okay, um, I think that's it for my slides. Yep. So now I'll turn it over to Fuxan. He's one of our top data scientists and he's in charge of uh, the recommendation and personalization uh, platforms within Repton. Uh, thanks, Neil. Let me uh, share my slide. Okay, one well, second. Okay. okay. Uh, wait a moment. Uh, try to share. Okay. Okay. Um, again, uh, hello everyone. Um, Fook, you can see my slide, right? Is it good? Yes, uh, thanks. Uh, yeah, we can see your slide. Yeah, thank you a lot for your time to join uh, today. And uh, I also really want to thank uh, Machine Learning Tokyo Group for helping us uh, organizing this meetup today. And actually I attended some event organized by MLT before. I think I just shared with uh, Susanna that I attend one at the campus of the Tokyo uh, University and also another online um, event last year. And I really enjoy uh, both of them. And today I really hope that we can have a great discussion. So, um, let me jump to uh, the uh, agenda today. So I will start first with a short shell introduction. Then I will go through a short introduction about a recommendation system. Then share with you about some new types of recommendation we are working on for recruiting services. Then after that, maybe I will go a bit, a bit more uh, details about uh, buy win recommendation and then show you how multitask learning can help uh, to improve it. Uh, finally, maybe I will go some uh, conclusion. And uh, today, uh, to make uh, the presentation more interactive, maybe uh, if you want to comment or clarify some parts, uh, feel free to send your question to, I think, to the Zoom chat. Uh, maybe I will stop uh, sometime in the middle and then we can uh, answer some questions. So it's going to create more interactive between the uh, presenter and also the audience. So. Uh, let me start with the shell introduction. Uh, so you can see uh, the QR code here is the link to my uh, LinkedIn. So uh, just in case you want to connect later. So uh, I got my PhD from uh, Tokyo Institute of Technology in uh, 2012. At the time I worked on uh, quantum image processing. I also got the Young Researcher Award for the research topic. And on the right side here, uh, you can see the number of citations to uh, my paper 
more of the citation uh, for the work on uh, quantum computation, just to show that the uh, research topic is still active. And recently, I found out one uh, open source SDK, uh, the QKIS here. It actually can help you to implement quantum algorithm. And that algorithm can also run on real uh, quantum computer, like the one uh, supported by IBM. And uh, the, inside the project, you also provide a textbook to help people learn more how to implement quantum algorithm with the SDK. And in the textbook, you also have one section writing about my uh, previous research here. You can see this uh, FRQI is my uh, previous research. And then uh, after my uh, graduation, I wanted to work in industry. And my first job was a full stack engineer at uh, NetMy Inc. Uh, the company gave me an excellent environment to learn about building scalable web system in general. And maybe more importantly, uh, to learn how to deploy a, a recommendation system to production from scratch. And then after finishing the first project on uh, recommendation, I find out that uh, recommendation system are very interesting. So I share what I did with some friend of mine. And then actually one of friend uh, later introduced me to uh, Rakuten to continue working on recommendation uh, system. Then, yeah, you know, later uh, I joined Rakuten uh, grouping from 2015. From that time, I have worked a lot uh, with uh, many different uh, recommendation system. I also got some uh, pattern in the uh, recommendation uh, domain. And I really think that uh, recommendation is one of the most important system that any website should have. Uh, today, I really hope I can show you some uh, interesting aspect uh, about recommendation. And uh, in here, uh, just to notice that uh, here is my latest paper. It's not directly related to uh, recommendation. It's more about how to do uh, image classification or object detection a little bit faster in, uh, in that sphere context. Uh, yeah, if you're interested, you can take a look. So uh, before I start, I just want to introduce a bit about my team so that you have the context about uh, the skill uh, of the recommendation system which the, my team is working on. The name of the team is uh, Rakuten Recommendation and Personalization Platform. Uh, we are an international team with uh, 15 members located uh, in Japan, France, and Spain. Uh, my team provides recommendations for uh, items, uh, UIs, and personalization for more than 20 services in, in Rakuten. Uh, we have to uh, basically improve the user experience for the services and so, and so uh, contribute directly to the businesses. Our API uh, delivery recommendation for more than 400 placement in total, not only inside Japan, but also in Taiwan, also in EU, in US. And you know that we uh, have to handle extremely high traffic in our API, especially during big event like uh, the super sale for, uh, for Japan services. And, and also another important aspect is that uh, to continuously improve the quality of our recommendation, we have to conduct a lot of A-B tests. And the key point here is that in order to run uh, many uh, A-B tests, we really need to make the cost to learn any A-B test very low. So a lot of engineering efforts for automation is actually needed under the hood. So let's start the uh, introduction about uh, recommendations. Uh, I tried to find a good exam, a good definition about it. And uh, actually I got one from Wikipedia as you can see on the right side of the slide. Uh, you can see uh, there are uh, three important parts uh, of a recommendation system. Uh, filtering, uh, suggestion of items and putting them to a particular user. Uh, I, I really like the cartoon on the left side. Uh, the cartoon is quite simple. Uh, it shows a really good example about uh, recommendations. Uh, in, uh, in this example, first you can see a suggestion of four items. Maybe the first one is a yogurt, uh, and then the carrot, bread, and meal for an user who is checking a banana. So uh, this recommendation is really uh, relevant to this user because she may want to buy this yogurt or the bread together with banana to have their meal, uh, her meal. And actually, uh, there is a, a filter that reduce from uh, many possible items to the only four relevant items. 
And when we're talking about a filtering system, I think uh, we all know about one very important system, uh, the search system. So on this slide, I'm showing you um, uh, some recommendation on the left side and an example of search is on the right side. So uh, what are the differences between a recommendation and a search one? I think you can make a guess. Maybe I uh, pause here and give you maybe five to 10 seconds to come up with your answer. Okay, uh, maybe it, uh, I think it's good. Uh, anyway, uh, there are maybe many answers for, for this question. But uh, uh, personally, I think the basic one is the input of the two system. Uh, to you assert, uh, we need to input some uh, keywords. For example, in here, you need to enter the coffee mark here. So the user need to express the request or their needs in terms of words. But uh, for a recommendation, we don't need to uh, input such an explicit input. You just need to visit a website and then uh, the recommendation will show up right away. So in, in general, uh, if we need to have user to filter some information without uh, requiring them to input uh, their request explicitly, maybe using a recommendation system will be a suitable approach than a search system. So we just talk that uh, the input for recommendation is different from search and the output actually is also different. For the search, normally we expect uh, some item in the result, uh, let's say in the context of uh, e-commerce, but for recommendation, we can have many different types in the output. For example, if you want to uh, recommend a list of category or a list of shop for, to an user, the input of course is the user, but the output gonna be a category, category or shop. And you also can combine multiple input entity uh, together. For example, if you uh, want to build a recommendation from two input, one is for a user, and so another one is from the targeted shop. So the recommended item is going to be the item that relevant to the user, but only coming from the shop. And also in the middle here, we also have some uh, contextual feature. For example, uh, even with the same user, the recommendation uh, may be at the home page or uh, at the checkout page of uh, um, e-commerce website can be totally different. It depends on the context where you see the recommendation. So let me show you some uh, concrete example. The first example I got here uh, on the left side, is, I got it from uh, Rakuten France. Uh, I don't speak French, but I guess it's about a similar product here. Uh, in this case, the uh, input entity is a product, and I think is uh, about this uh, one piece uh, comic book. And the output uh, entity is also a product that are similar to that comic. So in this example, uh, actually, uh, we can show exactly the same recommended item to all user who checking this uh, one piece page. But uh, recently, there are new researchers that are working on so-called uh, session by recommendation, where we try to include the information uh, from user section to improve uh, recommendation. So I put the paper, the survey paper here, if you can check later, if you are interested in this area. And the basic idea is even we have the same input item, the recommendation may be different, depend on uh, what uh, the user had in the current session. And my team also got a pattern uh, around this area. On the right side, uh, it's a, a typical uh, recommendation for you. And in here, uh, we have this uh, Kai, uh, which is quite uh, popular in uh, Rakuten Ichiba service in Japan. The input here is the user, and the output here is about uh, the items. So uh, let me share an overview about uh, a recommender system. We have uh, some component, main component in this diagram. The first one is uh, the tracker component, it's here. And this uh, component have uh, to collect the behavior data of user, why they are interacting with the system. And from the data collected by the tracker, uh, there may be uh, some uh, ETL pipeline to transform the raw data into a 
unified format for uh, user behavior, then that uh, data will be stored in the database to use uh, easily later by uh, recommendation engine. And in many cases, this uh, uh, user behavior data will be enriched by some data from like uh, catalog data here or BI data sources here. Uh, uh, to have uh, to 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 have a uh, have a better view about uh, what a user is doing, and then uh, recommendation engine will consume this uh, user data to build recommendation, and at the time we deliver uh, recommendation to the user, there will be a, an API here, and this API may uh, change the uh, recommendation result using the real-time context like uh, what we just discussed earlier. Is it from the top page or is it from a checkout page? And also the uh, A-B test function also normally implemented uh, when we deliver the uh, recommendation. So until here, we already have an overview about what a recommendation system look like. Let's go into the general data representation you by many uh, recommendation engine. Uh, the data is normally uh, represented as a matrices. The row here, uh, for example, are for the item and the column here are for the user. Uh, there are two data types uh, for the element inside uh, these matrices. One is uh, numerical, larger matrix uh, here on the left. And another one is binary, like the one on the right side. Uh, for the numerical, the data source is uh, normally coming from a review or star. So for example, uh, you can give a review or star to a movie from one to five. Uh, five may mean you really like the movie. Uh, one may mean you don't really like the movie. Uh, so in general, uh, these numerical data are harder to guess because the user need to uh, explicitly input the number. Uh, for the binary, uh, the data sources are normally uh, from user uh, interaction with the system like click or purchase. And using the tracker we just mentioned in previous slide, we can obtain this data quite easy. But the thing is uh, the user intention, uh, does uh, the user really like product or not, will be uh, quite difficult to measure. And another thing is actually you also can converse uh, between the two types of representation. So let's say if you start with a numerical one, uh, if you put some threshold on the number, let's say uh, you consider everything above four uh, in the review example, in this example. So like four and five gonna be equal to one. That means you like the movie. Everything lower than four, uh, you don't like the movie. So you can convert from a numerical one to a binary one. And also uh, basically you have some method to convert back from binary to a numerical one. Uh, one more advantage is uh, for the binary data is that we uh, there are many efficient ways to measure similarity. Uh, for example, uh, let's say we want to compute the similarity between the two items. For example, the row, the first row and the second row here. And if we use it as a track distance, uh, so for example, this uh, union basically is that how many uh, users that uh, actually uh, have both interaction with the two items. So basically you have only a single user in this one. So the intersection is one. And then in here, this union, uh, basically you have four different users actually have the interaction with the uh, two items. So the Zakat distance will be uh, one over four. So uh, you can see that just doing some counting, you basically can compute the similarity. So that's why uh, there are many uh, very uh, scalable methods to compute this kind of similarity. Similarly, you can define the similarity based on cosine or conditional probability very easy. Uh, also, uh, let's say if we work with uh, numerical uh, matrices, uh, so there is a popular algorithm named uh, matrix factorization. Also, there are some variants of that uh, let uh, people uh, like invent later after the first version. Uh, the idea is, the big idea here is, to uh, decompose uh, the big matrix into two lower uh, dimension matrices. And when we already have these uh, two uh, lower dimension matrices, we can use them to compute uh, the rating uh, of any combination of user and item. 
However, when we do the decomposition, we need to uh, minimize the total difference between the original big uh, matrix and the product of the two lower uh, dimension matrices by uh, using gradient descent techniques. And also when we try to learn that, we also may need to have some uh, regularization to avoid overfitting. Uh, there, of course, there are some challenges to when uh, building recommendation. The first one also maybe the biggest one is the co-start problem. It happened when we have new item or new user. Uh, in this case, we don't have any behavior data about them. So basically you don't have the row or you don't have the column in the matrices. Uh, so uh, we may need to use uh, external data uh, in this case, like uh, item title or item image. We call them a content-based approach. Uh, or we can use a technique called uh, cross service. I will try to introduce uh, this uh, cross service later. Uh, for popular product, of course, uh, they may cause some uh, noise in our recommendation, but it's not uh, really a big issue. Uh, for short and long tail, uh, in general, uh, we need to uh, collect more data and also maybe using a hybrid approach between behavior and content base, maybe have uh, to uh, solve the issue. Uh, let me quickly uh, in, uh, talk about the uh, one content by approach uh, with you embedding. Uh, as you can see in this slide, uh, it's a pipeline we have for the approach. We divide the pipeline into uh, some steps, starting with the uh, embedding generation. So basically, there will be some model to extract the embedding from text or images. Uh, the model can be a uh, like pre-trained model available from popular uh, model hub like uh, TensorFlow hub, or maybe uh, recently people prefer Hacking Fay uh, hub. Uh, anyway, uh, or we also can uh, train uh, our own model. But uh, after we use this model, we're gonna have uh, the embeddings and we need to do a distributed search uh, for the top case similar items. Then uh, we uh, store the result in a database then uh, it's gonna be used in the delivery API letters. So actually Amazon also published a paper uh, with a similar architecture. Uh, I put the paper here, uh, you can take a look later for the details. I think I kind of uh, finished the past one uh, to introduce about a recommendation. If uh, we already have some question, I can try to answer at this time. Is it okay? Or do we have okay. any question? Yeah, Puxan, uh, we do have a couple of questions. Um, so we have first is uh, one from Vijayendra. Like, can we use collaborative filtering for recommendation, recommending items that customers already brought recently, uh, assuming that the matrix user item is explicitly by signals? Uh, uh, let me try to see your question. Uh... I think what I just presented actually is a uh, collaborative filtering. So basically, uh, there are two ways of seeing the collaborative filtering. One is uh, people call it user base. So basically, you, you start from user side. Then you try to find what are the user actually uh, consuming. Then you use uh, that to recommend to the user. Also, there are some approach that using uh, from the item side. So uh, if you consume some items, you're going to try to find some other items that related to that item, and then you uh, recommend those items. So uh, uh, what I just uh, shared before about uh, try to use some similarity, you can use that for both user size or item size. Uh, it can be the matrix factorization or can be the binary one. I hope it answers the question. Okay. Thank you. So we have a few more questions. So I think uh, let me quickly run through them. Uh, Francisco is asking, like, uh, is it challenging to deal with different categories in recommendation engine? Examples, scoring behaviors for books are different from evaluations for hardware. So how do you deal with this? Uh, if we have to handle, uh, I mean, uh, let's say the domain of the, the, the item are separated like, okay, let's say books and then uh, maybe hardware. 
So uh, the maybe straightforward approach gonna be separate the, the catalog. So you treat uh, everything inside book as one recommendation, or you treat everything inside the hardware is uh, also like another um, recommendation. So it's it uh, maybe less confusion between uh, the two domains. But for example, the thing I just shared before, uh, the, the, the content-based approach can actually quite uh, like a generic. So let's say if you put uh, the title of the hardware into the, um, the embedding, you're gonna have the embedding and then it's up to you to try to find what are the similar, it can be inside the hardware domain or it can be in book domain. Let's say you want to find the book about this hardware. So you just input the embedding from hardware, but you try to find the similar item from books. So it still can, can do something like that. I see. Mm -hmm. right. uh, we have uh, one more question. Uh, actually, two, three, three more questions. Uh, so uh, let me go one by one. Uh, one is from Datsun. Uh, so how to deal with multiple types of data for one recommendation? For example, let's say you want to utilize buying history, viewing history, comment history, uh, how to recommend items to buyer uh, to, in order to recommend items to the buyer. I, I see. Uh, so uh, maybe I, I will go back to the, the uh, maybe let me see, uh, maybe, uh, maybe this one. Okay, back to this binary uh, ones. So let's say we have one binary matrix for uh, uh, purchase history or buying history. And then we have another uh, matrix for view history. And then maybe we have another matrix for uh, comment history. So one way to combine these three uh, metric or more together is you can define a way to have a linear combination for these uh, multiple matrices. Let's say you treat uh, like everything from by buying history is like four, viewing is one, comment maybe two. And then when you combine uh, them together, basically you have a, a, a final uh, matrix that look like the numerical one. And then after that, you can start using the matrix factorization, for example, or other techniques. So uh, that is also one way uh, it can be done. Or uh, let's say you uh, try to build uh, from its uh, data set, uh, the list of candidates from, let's say you only view by history, you view a list of candidates, you view only the viewing history also have a candidate. And then at the end, you try to combine the list of candidates together at the, run, the last state, like the ranking state, or maybe uh, something before that. Hmm. All right. Uh, there is one question on uh, training uh, from Sugi San. Uh, so, uh, Sugi is asking uh, when building recommendation system, did you guys train one global model with all the interactions or training one model per category or training one model per category and geographic region? So, uh, I think uh, the question is about like how do you generally have that training strategy, right? Like to update, update the model, like whether you train it with different categories for model or put everything into as a one model package into one model. That's true. Um, thank you a lot for the question. Actually, this, uh, uh, this really depends on the size of the data we have. So let's say, for example, even with the, the, the uh, category, uh, but it's only already big enough. Maybe uh, we don't need to uh, try to combine with other category uh, that uh, use uh, data from that category by itself, try to optimize for that uh, category. Uh, it's also a good, let's say, but in the case that you, you don't have enough uh, data per category, so that means uh, you have to combine in some way. And then at that time, uh, training a global one may be better because you can see uh, some uh, like cross uh, category uh, interaction uh, at the same time. So I mean, really depend on how, how much data you have. So if uh, the data to which maybe a uh, combination is, uh, maybe your algorithm cannot finish, or maybe you need a lot of hardware in order to, to scale uh, the training uh, part. I see. Okay. Uh, so uh, Fuxan, we do have a few more questions, but I think uh, considering the time we have now, we have past 7.30. Uh, what yes. think, like maybe yeah, maybe I continue, continue and then maybe uh, at the end yeah. uh, we can come back. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 
Uh, yeah. Sorry for that. So, uh, but like for all the other members, please keep. Yeah, for other members, please uh, keep posting your questions on Zoom, and uh, we'll take them collectively uh, in the end. Yes. Uh, so I think I I'll stop here. Uh, so let me continue from this one. Um, right. Uh, let me see. I want to hide the. Uh, okay. So uh, recently we work on a project uh, to help user um, uh, kind of use uh, many different services in uh, Rakuten group. Uh, this is quite unique to Rakuten comparing to other companies. Uh, as you know that uh, Neo just introduced that we have 70 services under the group. So before we have a fixed widget like this and we want to change it to a personalized uh, widget. Uh, that means each user will have a different list of services optimized for the user. For example, in this uh, screenshot, uh, actually these services uh, are for my personal account. And you can see, maybe you cannot read the Japanese, but uh, this one is for travel, uh, this one is for bank, and this one is for fashion, and this one uh, are for, is for mobile, like the mobile. So actually I use all of these service. And uh, in order to implement uh, this new uh, recommendation, we use an approach named a cross service or maybe uh, people normally call a cross domain in academic uh, literature. I listed two uh, review paper here. Uh, you can take a look later, the two review paper here. Uh, so the main idea in cross service, uh, uh, actually quite simple, uh, but they have to solve the issue of cost strat uh, partially. So in a uh, cross service, we'll have a, a sort service and then a target service. For example, the source service in our uh, e-com gonna be our e-commerce uh, service, the Chiba, uh, let's say here. And then let's say the target service is Gora service. So it is uh, Gora service here. Uh, it a uh, service related to Goof, so like you can book a, a Goof course or a book a Goof lesson and so on. So in this example, let's say we have some user who uh, have some activity in uh, Ichiba service, and also they also had uh, use the Gora service. So we call them uh, user overlap. So the user that uh, use both service. And then let's say uh, later we, uh, there are some users that only use uh, Rakuten Ichiba here, but they show some similarity with the user uh, actually use the GOP, uh, the GOP service. So uh, we can actually uh, recommend them the Gora service. So in that case, the Gora service will uh, acquire new user for their service. So it helps a little bit. Uh, another part is uh, item overlap. Uh, for example, uh, for book, you know that we normally have two versions. One is paper and another one is ebook. So actually inside Rakuten Group, we have uh, Rakuten Books here, uh, selling uh, paper books. And we also have Rakuten Kobo, actually selling ebooks. And anyway, uh, they are the two versions of the same book. So we can actually utilize the traffic happen in book service and use it to build recommendation for Kobo service because uh, basically the ID can be linked. And also from the Kobo service, we can use the traffic to build recommendation for book service. So this uh, cross service can help to solve partially the cost start issue. Another one example I want to introduce is what we call a personal basket. Uh, at the beginning, uh, we observed that uh, for user who uh, daily uh, who buy daily goods in our e-commerce website, for example, like a mineral water bottle or tissue or diapers, uh, the user normally uh, buy multiple items at the same time. And with the uh, previous UI, uh, the user had to first uh, find one item, add it to cart, then back to find the second item, then add it to cart, and then so on. So definitely the process were not uh, very convenient for many users. And the goal of this project was to provide a rec personalized recommendation to uh, each user. Our system will uh, recommend a list of items 
which user may want to add to cart. And also display, display them in a single page, like uh, the, the screenshot I have here. And also we also add the add to cart button right under each recommended item. And we uh, launch an uh, online A-B test to confirm the performance. The new approach was much, much better than uh, previous logic we have. And now we really it's in production. Uh, so about the logic itself, uh, when we uh, generating a personal basket, we build an uh, ensemble of multiple components, as you can see there. Uh, each component uh, try to cover a part of what user may need. So we start from uh, the data, from browsing and purchase history of each user. Then we have three main components. The buyer again here try to uh, cover what user may uh, want to repurchase. And the cross genre here uh, actually try to cover uh, what user may need uh, as a complementary to what they already exposed. And then the similar item component try to cover the need of uh, selecting different variant of uh, some similar item. Then we combine these uh, candidate into the final recommendations uh, and we uh, give the lead to the user. Uh, the uh, thinking quite simple, but uh, actually uh, we apply three pattern for this logic. Uh, so uh, another project I want to introduce is uh, we want to re-ranking the widgets uh, in the top page of the, the Ichiba, the big e-commerce website we have in a rafting group. Uh, and I think it's also one of the largest e-commerce website in the world. And similar to uh, other big website, normally the top page uh, will have multiple components. Um, we call them uh, widgets. Uh, for example, we may have uh, a component like uh, browsing history, uh, another one like uh, buy again. Uh, I will talk more about buy again later. Uh, some widgets may contain a personal -like content and maybe some other widgets may have fake content. Also, each widget may have its own revenue contribution to the whole revenue of the top page. For example, the revenue from an advertisement widget, maybe new in chart of that, uh, will be uh, very different from the browsing history widget. And uh, in order to change the order of the widget for each user, we uh, started with an approach for estimating the user interest to each widget in the top page. For example, if we can estimate the user interest for browsing history widget is two, maybe buy again is three, and so on, uh, then it's very simple. We just rerun the widget accordingly uh, based on this number. Uh, there are some common uh, techniques to do uh, things like this, like uh, using bandit or contextual bandit. Uh, however, uh, the problem becomes more complex when uh, we start uh, need to uh, optimize not only the user interest, but also the total revenue of the top page. And actually we're still working on uh, this uh, optimization problem now. Okay, uh, I think I finished the part for introduce new type of recommendation in uh, Rakuten. Uh, if uh, we want to continue with some question, I can uh, stop here and then answer some, and then we move on to the, uh, maybe the last part of my presentation about uh, deep learning and multiple task learning. Okay, got it. When, uh, when I was looking at the questions, one common question which we are getting is uh, a few people have asked it multiple times is, uh, I think you, uh, Fuxan, you answered that uh, we, there are two strategies, right? To uh, uh, either you can do linear combined the result with multiple matrix uh, factorization or re ranking. Uh, common question which uh, people are asking is which strategy Rakuten is using? Um, and uh, what is the strategy to update uh, the behavior model or user profile? <laughs> I know I haven't. Mean, <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, uh, the, the, the quick answer is going to be uh, we do both. Uh, so it depends uh, uh, when we, we have, uh, let's say, when we try to combine, uh, normally the data should be small enough for to do the linear combination at the metric level because the metric itself is quite big. So, uh, but when we uh, have the data quite uh, large on the D, uh, I, I mean, we're going to use a second strategy that try to uh, 
make the, the, the candidate list first and then try to combine them later on. Maybe I, I hope I answer your question, not directly. Sorry. <laughs> Hey, um, I think uh, thanks. I think that that should be fine. Um, uh, so there were a few other uh, suggestions also in the chat. Like I think uh, Seagate was suggesting like CTR is a good metric. Do we use CTR in any of the recommendations? Uh, uh... Uh, yes, we we do uh, uh, for sure in our A/B test. Uh, uh, we we have CTR as a one a KPI main KPI. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Uh, there was uh, this uh, one more question from Sugi. Uh, so with recommendation system metrics, it's better to start with uh, NDCG or precision uh, K or mean reciprocal rank and worry late about the offline metrics. So uh, he's asking it's better to invest early into the definition of online success criteria. Like, I mean, I think he's um, asking about uh, metrics uh, on recommendation systems. Uh, I think it's it, uh, quite uh, often uh, uh, lies. Uh, I, 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 I saw this kind of question a lot. Uh, so uh, maybe that also one thing different from um, uh, academic and also industry. Uh, because uh, uh, honestly, in the industry, uh, the data change quite often. And if you collect a data, let's say like one year ago, you try to optimize for that really, uh, I mean, uh, you can really focus on try to uh, optimize for all the apply KPI like uh, what you just mentioned, uh, but the data already changed. So uh, uh, like I said before, when we have an uh, online A-B test system that somehow quite cheap to run an online A-B test, uh, maybe, of course, we have to do some apply to filter something uh, that obviously not really good. But uh, if the cost for a loan and online is uh, quite cheap, we maybe are going to prefer online to see something faster. Uh, mm. Yes. All right. Yeah. Uh, that in continuation of that, like I think uh, there were uh, questions around like also what are the best metrics to know the recommendation system is actually effective uh, to a user or not. Uh, that was a question from Rico. And uh, like, uh, do you have any particular uh, like uh, good suggestions which uh, which kind of like metrics works best uh, or more, uh, recommended one? Uh, 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 no, uh, this one is also uh, uh, quite difficult because um, uh, how do I say? Um, uh, because it's uh, depend on uh, like like I said, we have mm. like uh, four hundred uh, placement. And then if we uh, have to go into uh, managing uh, its uh, placement quite carefully or spend a lot of time for that, maybe we don't have enough time to, uh, to do something new. So uh, we kind of like do some trade-off. So sometimes we uh, have a monitoring system, we have an A-B test system, and then we use that as a, a final metric that uh, uh, we're managing the, the home system. So let's say if I uh, work on a particular, uh, let's say a POC project, maybe uh, something, let's say if the model is kind of like a prediction, I can share something about prediction later. So you only have some uh, typical uh, like metric for prediction. For example, if it uh, like a classification problem, you only the accuracy, you have F1, you have on your AGC and things like that. So it depends on how you frame the problem as well. So uh, recommendation can be quite diverse. It depends on uh, really uh, the problem that you uh, formulate the problem you have into uh, some specific uh, maybe machine learning approach. And in that approach, maybe you already have some things standard to measure uh, like apply metric for that. All right. Okay. One quick last question before you go into the final part of the recommendations. Uh, so, how do uh, this question is more about like uh, how do you handle this fast moving of data that comes from different data sources, right? Like the recommendation engine will try to aggressively refactorize the metrics repeatedly uh, when you are using uh, uh, the factorization solution. So, uh, generally, when it comes to designing such kind of systems, the engine needs to renew the matrices or uh, for a fixed period of time. So, uh, how, in Rapidan, how such kind of things are done uh, at this uh, when you have such a huge amount of data streams coming in? Uh, 
but I, I think the question had too many persons. I try to see where is the question. Uh... Ah, let me post it again. Um... Yes, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I posted it again. Uh, okay, okay. So, uh, yeah. so uh, uh, basically, uh, there are two things. Uh, one is you try to uh, make your data fresh. So instead of try to accumulate the data for a long time, uh, you can do a strategy that try to make your data a little bit shorter, but always ship uh, together with uh, the traffic. So let's say uh, instead of try to have like maybe three years of data, you just focus on the six years, so uh, six months, sorry. So at least you have the data fresh and then it kind of reflect what happened uh, inside the, the system. Because actually for a uh, big website like Rakuten, a lot of uh, old items gonna be removed and new items gonna join. So uh, even you try to have a really big data, uh, it may not really uh, the, the optimal ways. And then uh, when you already have the uh, data fresh, I think the results are gonna be the model if we do the uh, regularization well, it will be try to capture the, the main signal from the fresh data. Maybe I try to answer in this way, it's not uh, really direct. Mm. Yeah. All right. Uh, we still have a lot of questions today, uh, but I think since we have limited time, Putsan, I think yes. I would like to you to go to the last part, uh, as, uh, last phase of this presentation. That's yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot for yeah. your question. Uh, let me see. Uh, okay. Uh, so uh, of course we uh, we're not very surprised when we see uh, deep learning being used in uh, recommendation because it's uh, too successful. Uh, let me try to pick some paper to show you uh, some example where deep learning can be applied in recommendation. Uh, the first example I pick here is uh, about. Uh, why and deep learning uh, for recommender uh, system. The paper uh, show uh, quite simple uh, neural network architecture just to combine the spa and dense feature for a classification class. And then uh, in the paper, the output is actually the probability that an user will install the recommended app in Google Play. Uh, and then the second paper I pick here is the neural collaborative filtering is a deep learning version of the, the matrix factorization we just discussed earlier. Uh, however, you know, in practice, there may be some other uh, objective besides this uh, like uh, uh, probability uh, or, um, uh, I mean, uh, not only we have only a single objective uh, and then we will need to consider in uh, uh, recommended system like we just discussed uh, earlier when we do the widget pre-ranking. Not only about the user intention, but also need to consider the revenue of your home topics. Uh, so uh, recently I see that more and more people are discussed about a multiple uh, task learning uh, for recommendation. For example, the paper on the left side uh, is about recommending what video to watch next in uh, YouTube. And in this paper, as you can see, the system tried to uh, optimize the user engagement objectives, like the clicks, and also the user satisfaction objectives, like the, how people reading the video. Uh, and also, of course, the paper also introduced some uh, interesting aspect about architecture design, like they have this uh, mixture of expert or the gating network and so on. Uh, and then the second paper on the right side is also from Google. Uh, I personally attended the presentation last year. Uh, it shows a different way uh, of using multi-task learning, not directly to optimize different objectives like the paper on the left, but it's more about introducing some extra tasks to help the person of the main task better. So you can consider it as like the regularization technique uh, in this case, so introduce also the way to introduce the other that also kind of like to uh, introduce uh, some heuristic that uh, to guide the uh, training uh, process later. So now uh, with that all of that context, let me introduce the buy gain uh, recommendation. Uh, the problem statement uh, at the beginning, uh, the marketing team asked us to do the problem for the big e-commerce service in the group. Uh, the problem statement is quite simple. Uh, we just need to uh, recommend some item 
uh, which user may want to repurchase them. Uh, for example, let's say uh, there is a user who already uh, purchased uh, this uh, bag of rice uh, three times already in the past. Uh, should we show it as a buy again uh, item? Uh, and we did a lot of exploratory uh, data analysis to understand the problem from various data sources we have. Uh, and uh, one typical graph I can share with you is something like uh, this one. So on the x-axis, uh, you had uh, how many days between two consecutive purchases for the same item from the same user. And then on the y-axis, uh, you had how many users that had uh, that behavior. And so in this area gonna be some users that purchase that item with really high frequency. And in here, maybe some user purchase uh, that item with lower frequency. And then based on this kind of analysis, we release the first approach, which is basically just a set of simple rules with some threshold. So maybe you can see something like this. If the condition one is met, you're gonna show it a buy again. If not, you check the rule number two and so on. Uh, we wanted the first approach uh, uh, to be simple because the feature quite new and we didn't know much about its performance. Uh, so instead of uh, spending too much time on uh, the approach itself, we wanted to focus on making the feature available online first uh, at this point. Uh, and we also noticed that Amazon published a paper for this problem as well. The paper is here. Uh, in the paper, they try to use a statistical approach in which they try to use Poisson gamma model to fit the distribution of the time until make purchase. Uh, but we uh, don't use uh, the approach in our system, we use another one, I wanna introduce later. So in terms of the data, input data for buy again, uh, the data are quite simple. So for each pair of user and the, uh, the purchase item uh, that user purchase, uh, we have the list of purchase event order by time. And in terms of database, you may have a table with three main columns, one for user here, one for the item, and one for the time when the purchase happened. Uh, and in our case, this table is quite big. We may have million of users and also million of items. So it's quite a big uh, table. And uh, using the experience we got from the phase one, uh, we started to frame, uh, like I, I said before, now we frame the buy again recommendation as a prediction problem. Uh, more specifically, it's a binary classification problem. So we try to extract some feature from the pair of user and the purchase item. Uh, some feature like uh, the number of days from the last purchase. It's here, number of days from the last purchase. Or how many times the user purchased that item before uh, the item price and so on. And then the database from the database that I just showed you before, we can actually generate the, the label. So if we see the user actually repurchase the item, we then label is one. If not, then the label is zero. So basically we can build a training data set for a buy again problem. However, most of user purchase only, uh, well, purchase an item only one. So uh, not many uh, user actually purchase uh, item more than one. So uh, we have a really imbalanced training data sets. Uh, of course, you know some technique to handle the issue like upsampling or downsampling. Uh, but in the next slide, I will introduce another way uh, to handle the issue. Uh, the way we uh, want to implement, uh, we call it like a, a positive uh, label mining approach. So uh, let's go back to the process of assigning label. So the first approach is that we can label uh, a pair of user and item to one if we saw the user purchase the item more than two times. For example, in this case, the user purchased the item three times, so we will label the pair user and purchase item as one. Uh, however, the issue with the approach are first. Um, for each user and item pair, we have only one label, be it or zero or one. So it doesn't help to solve the issue of imbalance. Uh, also, secondly, if the last purchase were really far in the past, uh, should we still consider the label is one? So let's say if this distance is quite far, maybe the label should not be one. Uh, 
to fit these two issues, uh, we consider the second approach. Uh, in this approach, we randomly generate some checkpoint. Uh, so for example, the checkpoint T1 here and then the checkpoint T2 here. And uh, then we can label the pair to one if there is a purchase happen after the checkpoint. For example, if we consider the checkpoint T1 here, this real data actually happened after the checkpoint. So we consider it, the label is one and so on. So the good thing about this approach is now we can generate more than one sample from a pair of user and purchase item. Then we use it approach to build our training data set and we train our classifier. Uh, and then uh, we saw the uh, performance much better than the root way approach we had in the first one. However, uh, later on, we also realized that actually the random process introduced some biases. For example, the, uh, the random distance between this uh, checkpoint and the next purchase uh, may have some uh, effect on the, the trending uh, in the downstream. So we came up with the third approach. Uh, this time we use a moving window. And inside the window, we try to split the data into two parts. So you can see it here. The, this part is for feature extraction. And then we use this part of data uh, to uh, assign the label for the pair of uh, user and purchase item. And uh, this approach, again, uh, improved the uh, performance a lot. Uh, so uh, both my team and also marketing team were very happy about the result. And, uh, one day, uh, actually, a marketing member came to me and uh, came to us and told us something like this. Okay, you guys did great job uh, for buy again in the web page. Uh, can we do is for notification? So they mean they start want to send the notification directly to the app to the user. Of course, I say that it should be easy because some quite similar to what we already have done. Uh, but uh, when I thought a little bit more about new requirement, uh, the problem is slightly different, as I showed you in this slide. Uh, for, for the web page, uh, the user may visit them at any time. So basically, the recommendation is waiting for the user passively. So we don't know when the user is going to come. And when user come, we also don't know when user is going to show up next time. So the timing until the next purchase for buy again, in this case, is less important. We can show some item a little bit early, or a little bit late. However, for the notification, we can send the notification multiple times. It will impact the user experience with the service. And also because we're pushing the notification actively, so we need to pick an item with the right timing to the next purchase so that the notification may help the user to remember to repurchase the item. So the problem now seems to be more about regression than classification. So after realizing the differences, the initial thought is to build a separate pipeline for buy again notification only, uh, separate from what we have already have for the classification. Uh, but we immediately realized that, okay, if we have another pipeline, come on, we wanna need to maintain another ML pipeline with training, inference, monitoring, and so on. So the cost is quite high. Uh, so uh, it's, Actually, when the multi-class learning seem to be a really good candidate for a buy again recommendation. So we just need to change uh, a bit in our formulation. Now we need uh, to have two different predictions from a single model, uh, one for web uh, repurchase, yes or no, and another one for uh, notification when repurchase. And all of the old uh, feature that we already have for classification can be reduced. Of course, we may need to add some new feature for the uh, regression prediction. So let me share a little bit more about the architecture that we use. Uh, uh, with uh, deep learning, it's quite easy to design some uh, neural network uh, which have multiple head or tasks. Uh, and we can keep the architecture simple. So we don't have to make uh, something complicated like the one uh, in the uh, YouTube uh, paper. Uh, we can do something sim uh, a little bit more simpler, like uh, we have some share layer here. And then we have some task layer here focus on different tasks. Uh, uh, but uh, we can, uh, can train uh, this model can uh, be in CPU or GPU, depend on what hardware we have. But we uh, always need to remember that when we do inference, our data is quite big. So we need to have a lot of uh, uh, parallel computation. Uh, 
So in this slide, I just want to share with you some sample code. Uh, I use TensorFlow here. Uh, maybe you don't like TensorFlow, but uh, the idea is it's quite easy to follow. Uh, I mean, uh, in here, you can see the share layer uh, that I show in the previous slide. And here is a task layer. And um, uh, we can use some uh, like uh, tool to have uh, to find a good uh, neural network architecture. For example, in here, I use Keratuna for that tool. Uh, it can help uh, to define the search space. And also it can, so can help uh, to uh, find a reasonably good uh, network architecture uh, based on some metrics. And then after we got the, the, the good uh, architecture, we, we can start train uh, uh, the model on that architecture. And then uh, when we do inference, uh, because our data are quite big uh, and our team quite familiar with Spark, so we use Spark here, but if you have another tool, maybe the uh, ideas uh, may be similar. So for the Spark, uh, we need to define uh, a Panda UDF. And uh, because the Panda UDF is gonna work on the, the executor. So you need to have a way to ship the train model into its executor. So I found there are two ways. One is you can use the broadcast width from uh, you, you broadcast the width of the train model to each executor, and then inside each executor you build back the model, and then you do the inference. Or maybe the Spark file is a little bit uh, simpler that you just uh, upload the model into Hadoop, and then using Spark file you can uh, pull back the model from Hadoop to the uh, worker, and then you do inference. And when you already have this uh, kind of Panda UDF, the inference, uh, the client code quite simple. You just have this uh, one line for classification and another line for regression. So uh, until this point, uh, we can design the model. Uh, we can train the model from uh, best architecture. Uh, we don't have uh, to worry much about uh, doing inference at scale. So uh, the final thing is that, okay, uh, the model gonna be better than the one uh, like another benchmark or not. Uh, so uh, to compare with other um, uh, popular approach, uh, I, 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 in this uh, slide, I just compare with uh, logistic regression and random forest for the classification task. And you can see uh, at least in this uh, AUC curve, you can see it's uh, better than uh, the other two. And so when we check the pre-decision and recall, it's also uh, bad, uh, quite good. Uh, if you keep the 80% precision, the recall is quite high, 92.7%. Uh, when you move to regression task, uh, in here, uh, you can see that may be difficult to see, but I, I can tell you that uh, the, the multitask DNA is better than linear regression, but it's not as good as the random forest regression. But the thing is, uh, MSE and MAE quite similar. So I think for regression, may, we may need to work a bit more on the feature engineering. For example, I think uh, we missed uh, one uh, very important feature is about the number of units of the large purchase. Because let's say if I purchase two units instead of one uh, in the large purchase, maybe the time until the next purchase is gonna be twice longer than if I purchase only one unit. And then uh, another aspect that we need to consider, uh, maybe you have heard about explainable AI recently. Uh, it's another topic uh, we need to consider when we deploy a deep learning model in production. Uh, it's uh, of course an active research area. So we may have uh, something better in the future, but currently there are two popular tools for explaining uh, deep neural network, uh, LAM and SAP, I put the two link there, if you're interested, you can check the, the now, it's quite uh, nice. Um, uh, I use LAM in this uh, slide. Uh, basically, the tool will help us to see why a deep uh, model give us the prediction. For example, here I wrote a sample, which the model predict is a bio again with really high coupling, uh, like 100% uh, here. And the, about the time until next year, it's estimated around uh, 0 0.4. And uh, I will not go into the detail about the feature, but uh, we can visually see uh, some feature positively support the prediction and uh, some other feature actually negatively uh, affect the prediction. So with this tool, you can actually debug the your uh, deep learning model better uh, before you decide to uh, use them in uh, production. 
I think maybe I'm over time, so I will skip uh, some slide. Uh, so uh, I jump to the conclusion. Uh, so as you can see, we uh, go through the gentle introduction about recommendation system, and so we uh, introduce some new type of recommendation in uh, the green services. And at the end, we just go through uh, multitask learning for Biogen. So in here is my uh, email and also the QR code for LinkedIn if you want to connect. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. And so in the next slide, I give uh, all the uh, link to the paper I present in this uh, presentation. Yeah, thanks a lot. Wow. Wow, well, thank you. Thank you for, um, for the great presentation. I think it was really uh, quite interesting to learn a lot of uh, new things. Um, we do have a few questions uh, remaining from the backlog. Um, uh, I know we are a little bit running over the time, uh, but uh, before uh, going through the questions, uh, I would uh, first of all like thank to uh, like to thank the Rapidant team, uh, Fuksan, Nilsan, and Sachikasan for having such a great presentation around recommendation and how recommendation is applied at this huge scale. Uh, it's uh, really quite interesting to know this thing. And also, I would like to thank the entire ML community, uh, the participants here, uh, for throwing out uh, really great questions to the recruiting team. I think uh, this way we can, it's a really uh, helpful for uh, both the community as well as the presenters. Um, so, uh, with that, like uh, uh, Fuxan, I think uh, there was one quick question from. Uh, uh, I think I don't know the name, but ITS Panda. Okay, interesting. Um, how do uh, the question was around how do you include seasonality in the recommendation, right? Like, I mean, uh, actually, uh, when they're like before the sales start or after sales start, or even like uh, summer sale or those things. So, uh, do you want to quickly answer that? Yes. Um... Uh, so uh, maybe I, I I skip one slide. So maybe I back to that slide. It may be easier to to introduce that. So uh, at at the end, for example, uh, maybe your question is in general. But uh, let me try to to uh, use example for uh, similar item as an example for for that. So let's say if you can frame the problem into a prediction. So for example, in here, if you focus on let's say try to predict the uh, click through rate. Uh, for uh, whatever widget you, you have, or you can try to see conversion rates, uh, KPI here. Um, so if you can frame your problem into a prediction problem, uh, you can have the freedom to choose what feature you use you, you for that uh, task. So you can introduce uh, the seasonality uh, into uh, one of the feature here, uh, and it may uh, help the, the model learn better. So actually, we we try uh, some uh, in some project we use uh, the the seasonality, and actually when you uh, introduce about uh, inventory optimization, uh, actually uh, we got the uh, seasonality from uh, that team. Uh, we not built by our own because it's actually quite complicated for that. So we use the feature uh, that generated by that team, and then we plug into our model and we try to optimize for the. Uh, click to it or the, maybe the learning to run model at that time. So it, it uh, depends on how you uh, frame your problem. Uh, some problems are gonna be easy to uh, introduce new feature. Some problem may be uh, difficult, but uh, yeah, in our case, if we formalize uh, as a prediction, I think it's quite easy to do so. Maybe have communities. Uh, I think there are a lot of questions on chat, but okay. Uh, till that, I think uh, we did have a few more questions. I think there was a question uh, around multi-arm bandage, right, for feedback. Uh, and uh, this question was quite interesting. Like, how do we uh, do we implement multi-arm bandage for the feedback loop to close that uh, loop uh, in Rakuten? And if if we apply, how it is applied at the scale, right? Like, I mean. That was one question from one of the audience. Uh, okay. Yeah, I think it's it's uh, quite uh, um, interesting and also quite difficult question uh, because uh, it if you just apply uh, the straightforward strategy from uh, uh, multi-arm bundles, for example, like uh, epsilon um, 
ไม่ไปดูอะไรเอฟซีลอนทามดู exploration and sometimes they do exploitation uh, it may not convert uh, because uh, let's say be honest that uh, let's say if user to uh, do a ride to the top page maybe one month they go in maybe maximum 10 t i m e so with 10 t i m e of data point uh, maybe you don't have enough data to uh, try to uh, estimate something so uh, Understand that maybe we need to do some grouping. Uh, so let's say if you somehow uh, can group a lot of user into one bucket, maybe at the time we will have enough data. For example, let's say uh, uh, maybe it's not work, but let's say if we just focus on uh, gender. So uh, suddenly we have only two buckets, and then uh, we can use the data from each bucket to estimate the uh, interest. Uh, the user interact to the uh, widgets, and then we can uh, split a little bit more. But if we start split uh, too big, uh, uh, I mean, in terms of system, it may be difficult to to, to scale because uh, for each group we need to collect back the data, and then uh, we need, uh, especially for uh, the the, the topics, it's quite difficult to get the real uh, revenue because. Uh, each team uh, actually in charge of each widget, and then they maybe have different way of uh, compute the the KPI. So is that also another issue? But uh, the general idea is uh, we uh, know that we cannot go into each individual. We have to group them. Uh, how we group them is still uh, the thing we are thinking about. Okay. Uh, so uh, with that, let me. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, the uh, thank you, MLT community. Thank you, f u k s a n Thank you, Nee. Thank you, Sachikasan. Um, and I think uh, we also had few members from your team who were helping to answer uh, some of the questions. I think Michael m e n t o n was working on the back and replying to a lot of uh, Zoom uh, questions. Right. So uh, thank you so much. Uh, for the